In this section, we're going to talk about how the protests uh, over the Townsend Act, the, you know, the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, all of these acts that the British have put on, and the protests that the colonists have against these acts, is going to lead from just pro protest to actual bloodshed. If you remember on the very day of the Boston Massacre, in Parliament, they uh, acted to repeal the Townsend Act. All of it, except for one small tax, and that's the tax on tea. Okay? Remember, the king had said that there should always be at least one tax to give us the right to tax. So they left the tax on tea, and I assume it's on tea because people loved tea. If you notice in the slide, by 1770, at least one million colonists brewed tea twice a day. It said that people would rather go without their dinner than miss their tea. So tea was an extremely important drink and, a, and really a way of life in the colonies. And people loved it. But there was a problem. Okay, there's the, still that tax on tea. Now, let's go back in for just a minute and talk about how tea was brought. Tea was actually brought to the colonies by the British East India Company. Okay, they would go to the East Indies, buy the tea, and then they would take it to the colonies where they then sold it to a group called tea merchants, kind of a middleman, who then resold the tea to the colonists at a higher price, okay? But the British East India Company is in financial trouble. The colonists had refused to buy this tea. Now, I mean, they love it. They love tea. But they're still very upset the fact that they're paying a tax. So many colonists have boycotted this tea, all right? And uh, the British East India Company actually has a charter from Parliament and the King. In fact, here is their kind of the royal seal, which is kind of a cool seal. But uh, Parliament's going to help the British East India Company, so they passed the Tea Act of 1773. And what the Tea Act does is it allows the British East India Company to bypass the middleman, the tea merchant, and sell it directly to the colonists. Now what this is going to do is going to make the tea the cheapest it's ever been. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Because I think the Parliament believes that they... The colonists are not buying the tea. They claim it's over taxes, but they're just being greedy. So if we make this tea, you know, cheap, even though there's still a tax on it, it's really about the money. They're really, they believe that we are just greedy. All right? So that, um, you know, the tea is going to cheap, be cheap, and we're going to buy the tea. So the colonists began to drink tea again, and everything was fine, right? All right? Wrong! No way! We won't buy it. Even though the cheap tea is cheaper than it's ever been, it's still the fact that we are being, our t being taxed without our consent, without representation, we still refuse to buy the tea. Now, Parliament is surprised. Uh, they cannot believe that we're still continuing to protest the Tea Act. And uh, the Tea Act actually upsets almost everybody. It upsets the colonists because there still remains the tax. It really upsets the American tea merchants because they've been cut out of the business. I mean, they can't afford uh, Christmas presents now. They, they've lost their way of making a living. So they're upset. And, of course, the parliament is upset because we're not buying the tea. So it is now November 1773, and in Boston Harbor floats three ships full of tea. All right? Now, the governor... Is Thomas uh, Thomas Hutchinson? If you remember from earlier lectures, he would have been the lieutenant governor when the colonists had burnt down his house and tore it down. All right, so he is now the governor, and he orders the tea to be unloaded. Well, you know, there's a big meeting in the town hall, and uh, some folks are there. The governor's there, and he's saying that this tea needs to be unloaded, and uh, uh, they disagree, obviously. Um, and the governor kind of, re, you know, the sense of liberty say, you know, send the ships back to London because we don't want it. We don't want it. Well, the govern, governor refuses the demand. And then Adam stands up in the middle of this meeting and he says, this meeting could do nothing further to save the country, which I think was some sort of signal. Because just then uh, the door flies open and a bunch of colonists disguised as Native Americans bust into the room and says, you know, Boston Harbor, a teapot tonight. The Mohawks are come. Now, everybody knows 
that it's not Mohawks. They know it. The British know it. And I've, I've all, always asked my students why they dressed up as Native Americans. It's not to fool people to make them believe that actual Native Americans are dumping tea into the harbor. It's because they don't want to be identified. Now the British know it's the Sons of Liberty. The Sons of Liberty knows it's the Sons of Liberty. The people of Boston know it's the Sons of Liberty. But they can't identify the actual individual. So I think that's why they do that. So what happens is, you know, they all leave the meeting house. They're joined by other group of guys from the Sons of Liberty. And they go out to the ships and they dump 342, whoops, 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. Here's a couple pictures. Uh, this is actually in a museum, this bottle right here. Supposedly this is actual tea that they gathered out of the harbor from Boston Harbor. But you see they're dressed up as Native Americans and they're dumping the tea. The ships are actually closer to the dock, so you know there's a big crowd gathering. I don't know if you can see that right there on the shore, watching the Sons of Liberty dump the tea into the harbor. But how do you think the British are going to think about this? Okay, I'll hum a song for you. Dun, 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 The Empire strikes back. Okay, Britain is outraged. They are outraged. This is the last straw. They cannot believe what the, the people of Boston have done. Now, in their mind, all the way back in London, I believe that they think that the entire town of Boston is a bunch of lawless, you know, hoodlums running around the streets of Boston. When in actuality, this is a fairly small group, okay? But Britain says, okay, that's it. We have had it. And then they pass four laws. Four laws. Now, the colonists called these laws the Intolerable Acts because they're too harsh. All right? Uh, Parliament punishes the entire colony of Massachusetts and especially Boston. Now, the British don't call them intolerable. They think they're just. The British call the four laws the Coercive Acts. They need to force. They are going to force this colony to obey and it's going to punish uh especially Boston, for their behavior. Okay, so, uh, so to coerce means to force and to punish. So what do these four laws contain? Well, the first law is that they're going to close the port of Boston. I mean, nothing is coming in or going out. No ships can leave at all. Until, get this, until the, all the tea has been paid, okay, and, and repay British officials for damage to their property. Now, you know darn good and well the Sons of Liberty are not going to pay for this. Okay, so who is? Who is? I had nothing to do with it. Why am I going to pay for it? So this is one of these laws. It's kind of like, you know, if I was in my classroom and somebody throws a, uh, a paper ball and I said, okay, that's it. I'm punishing this entire class. Nobody goes to lunch till somebody confesses. All right, well, that puts me in kind of a bad spot because what if nobody confesses? Am I going to keep him there forever? Well, it's kind of a same deal that Parliament is doing. Okay, number two, it forbids the Massachusetts colonists from holding town meetings more than once a year without the governor's permission. And you need to remember that this is how New England uh, does their business. They have town meetings all the time to discuss important matters in the colonies and in the towns. So this is a big deal um, to, to force them from meetings. See, they can't hold town meetings, all right? And I believe this is a way uh, to keep a closer hold on the shenanigans from what they see of the Sons of Liberty meeting. Okay, number three. Customs officials and other British officials will no longer be tried in the colonies for serious crimes. Okay, they're going to have their trials held either in Britain or in Canada. Okay, where they're going to have very favorable juries. So no longer do they have any threat of any kind of punishment in the colonies. All right, and finally... The fourth is Parliament has passed a new quartering act, and the colonists would have to again have to house British soldiers either in their homes, more than likely it's going to be in a public building, but in, in some cases actually in their homes. All right. Now these four laws were considered intolerable to the colonists, especially to the people of Boston. 
Ah, but Parliament's not done yet. They passed the Quebec Act. All right. Now, remember, the, the Four Intolerable Acts really affects the colonies of Massachusetts. But the Quebec Act does a lot to upset more of the colonists because what Parliament does, it gives all the land west of the Appalachian Mountains to Quebec. The land that these other colonies had wanted for some time. Remember the Proclamation of 1763 has forbidden the English colonists from going into the Ohio Valley. And it gives all that land to Quebec, the loyal sons of the king in Quebec. It also gives freedom of religion to all Canadian Catholics, which is unusual because in England they do not have freedom of religion to practice Catholicism. So I think this is a way, to, once again, just to stick it to the American colonists because they are not uh, kowtowing to Parliament and the king. Well, now the colonists are not going to stand idly by and let this happen without some sort of response. So let's look at the responses of the, of the colonists. Well, the first thing that they do, and this has been very effective in the past, is they kind of gin up those committees of correspondence again. And they send letters to the other colonies asking them to please send food and supplies to Boston. Because remember, Boston Harbor is closed. Can't get anything in or out. And man, the other colonies respond. They brought in corn and rice and Things from all the other colonies start funneling its way into Boston. All right? The first Continental Congress meets. All right? And this is a big one. They pass a resolution boycotting all British goods. Nothing. They're not going to buy anything from Britain, and they are not going to send Britain anything. Nothing. No more indigo. No more tobacco. No more lumber. So we have cut off all trade with Great Britain until the intolerable acts are repealed. All right? The Continental Congress also begins to urge the colonies to set up militias. Militias. Armed men. Right? Citizens who would serve as soldiers. Kind of like the National Guard today. All right? They are going to start training and drilling in case there is a war. I always like to tell my class that, you know, if you think about this whole thing leading up to this point, it's kind of like a pot sitting on a stove. And then you light the fire under the pot, and you just keep turning up the heat. You know, we we have the, the taxes, and then we protest by tarring and feathering, tearing down certain things, which leads to the Boston Massacre. They put on the Tea Act. We dump the tea in the harbor. The British respond by putting on the Intolerable Acts. We respond by setting up militias and boycotting all British goods. And, of course, finally, this pot, it boils over. And that's what happens. Lexington and Concord, the shot heard round the world. So in Boston at the time, you know, the king has sent quite a few soldiers into Boston. There's several thousand of them living in Boston. And they are determined, bound and determined, to, to do two things. They are going to find the leaders of the Sons of Liberty you know, Sam Adams, John Hancock, as well as, because they've heard from their spies, uh, people that are still loyal to the king, many of them still live in Boston, that the Sons of Liberty are storing ammunition and weapons. And they hear that the Sons of Liberty, John Adams, Sam Adams, or John Hancock and Sam Adams, along with a, a, a large number of weapons and ammunition, are stored in the town of Concord. All right? So, what happens? The British are bound and determined to catch the leaders and grab all that weapons and ammunition. But we have spies as well. We're watching all the movements of the, of the British Army. But we don't know if they're going to come, you know, sail up the Charles River. Are they going to march out on land? We don't know. We're watching all the time. And as many of you have heard the very famous poem by uh, Longfellow, uh, The Midnight Rider Paul Revere, um, we do have a signal set, set up. If the British decide to march towards Lexington and Con or to Concord by land, you know, we're going to hang up one lantern in the Old North Church. If they decide to sail up the Charles River, they're going to hang two lanterns in the Old North Church. All right, so we're looking, we're watching. Well, on the night of April 18, 1775, 700 British troops begin to cross the Charles River, which means they're coming by sea. All right, 
So they see that this is going to happen. And as you know, Paul Revere is watching them. He sails a, a rose, basically, across the Charles River. Now, uh, the interesting story I've heard is that uh, the rowboat that, Char, uh, that um, Paul Revere in is, you know, he puts the oars on the oar lock and begins to kind of row away, and it's super squeaky. So, you know, he goes back to shore. He sees a young woman, asks her to give her her, give him his, gee was give him her petticoat, which is kind of like the undergarments that they wear underneath her dress. He takes his petticoat, wraps it around the oars. Now, I wasn't sure if this was truly a, uh, 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 you know, a, a fact or if it was a legend. And then I found this picture, the one I'm going to show you next. Well, lo and behold, I found this picture, and it shows some cloth wrapped around the oar locks. All right? I don't know if you can see that. Well, it's kind of dark. Let me try to change colors here. Okay? Some cloth wrapped around the oarlock. I just thought that was interesting. All right. So Paul Revere crosses the Charles River. He has to be very quiet because British warships are in the Charles River. He makes it to the other side where he's met by uh, someone who has his horses. And he begins to ride throughout the countryside. But he's not the only one. There's Charles Dawes and Paul Revere. And there's others. In fact, Paul Revere is actually captured before he can make it to, to uh, Concord. But he does uh, able to warn the town of Lexington that the British troops are coming. So uh, daybreak arrives and the British begin to march towards Concord, but they do have to pass through the town of Lexington. All right. So on April the 19th, about 70 Minutemen are waiting for the British, you know, just outside the town. Now they're greatly outnumbered, 10 to 1. And I'm sure that the British military, you know, marches up and he tell you know, the commander of the British troops tells them to disperse. And actually, they begin to disperse. But somebody, and we don't know who, fires a shot. Okay, and this is called the shot heard round the world. Maybe it was the British. I doubt it. I think the British are very highly trained and disciplined. I suspect it's probably a, uh, uh, a nervous Minutemen, or possibly even somebody from the town of Lexington, fires a shot. But nonetheless, you know, a shot's been fired, the British respond, and eight colonists lay dead. Okay? Uh, the British sweep through the town of Lexington on the way towards Concord. Now, because of the heroic actions of some of these writers, like Revere and Dawes and others, uh, Concord has been warned that the British are coming. So they have a very uh, uh, early warning. And they have moved all the weapons and ammunition. The Sons of Liberty, the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, have left. And the British finally arrive in Concord, and they find nothing. Nothing. But on the way back to Boston now, they are met initially by 300 Minutemen, who then, uh, that number begins to grow, and they hide in the woods, they hide behind rocks and trees, and they dog the British all the way back. It's about 18 miles back to Boston shooting at the British at every uh, opportunity. And what happens is they kill 73 of the British troops and wound another 200. So now out of the 700 men who have left the previous night, the British, men, British soldiers who have left the previous night, 273 of the king's men are casualties, dead or wounded. Okay? So, you've just shot... 273 of the king's men. This pot has now boiled over. So from protest to revolution, the war's begun. And it's going to last for six years. But in the end, we will become an independent country, the United States of America. <laughs>